Are you under any obligation to make it easy for people to sue you? Well, to cut to the chase, uh, no, you're not. But let me explain what I mean by that um, while I stroll around on the Hellman Tour uh, and try not to fall into any crevasses. OK, so when you wish to sue somebody, you have to serve a claim form. And there are two ways you can do that without the permission of the court. You can either do personal service, which is where you get a process server to go up to somebody and go, there you go, mate, you're served. And the advantage of that is a process server will fill out a certificate of service saying, yes, I you know, found somebody with ginger hair and a bushy moustache and an eye patch and uh, I handed it over and he took it off me. So then you can say you can't dispute that it was received. But you can also just post it. Uh, you don't do registered post or anything. You just stick it in normal post. And if you send it first class, it's deemed to be received two days later. So they're the only ways you can do it without the permission of the court. Um, you have to serve either, like I say, on the person or at their last known address. And it has to be an address that you think they might live at. If you know they've moved out and you go, well, that's where they used to live, it doesn't count. Um, if it's a registered company, you can serve on their registered company address. So go on company's house, look it up and just send it there. Also, if either somebody says you can serve on my solicitors and provide the address then you must serve it at the solicitors and also if the solicitors say we are instructed to accept service then you must serve it on the solicitors the only exception to that is if it is a company you can still serve it to their registered address um, but if you get that wrong say for instance somebody says my solicitors will accept service and you serve it on them that's bad service Similarly, and you have to be careful here, say you've been in correspondence with somebody's solicitors, you know, all the pre-action stuff, but they've never actually said they will accept service, or the person's never said serve on my solicitors, and you do that, that is also bad service. So your claim just, you know, it wasn't issued. And if you go past the limitation, that's it, it's tough. Now, let's say, for instance, you've got no idea who somebody is or where they are, you can apply to the court for alternative service and they might say something like, well, look, we've got no idea where they are, but we've got an email address for them. Or it could even be they've allowed service by WhatsApp and Twitter. But let's say somebody gets that wrong. So, you know, somebody's served some papers. They've served it on your solicitors um, without them being instructed. Or they've served it on you when solicitors are instructed. What do you have to do? Do you have to let them know? I mean, let's say a limitation's coming up. No, you don't. You can just sit there and let limitation run out. Um, now, that happened recently in a case where somebody issued a claim and they got the claim wrong initially. Now, as it happens, when they finally served it properly, the claim got struck out. But they said, well, and normally if a claim struck out, you know, if you, you know, lose a pay's winner's costs. But they said, well, come on, they should get docked because they were deliberately uncooperative. They wouldn't give us any clue where to serve this stuff. They wouldn't assist us in any way. And the, you know, and the whole point is the CPR, the Civil Procedure Rules, says we're all meant to be uber cooperative um, these days. But what the court said is, well, all the costs penalties only count when it's conduct within the litigation. But, you know, the litigation hadn't started. So those penalties don't apply. And as the judge said in the recent case, OK, you're not going to win any medals for sort of good citizenship, but you've done nothing wrong. So the normal costs apply. Uh, loser pays winner's costs. Now, once something has been issued, though, that all changes. Because when it comes to awards of costs, um, you can take into account the conduct of the litigation. And generally speaking, we're encouraged to be cooperative. Now, that's not to say things like you don't have to point out, you know, mistakes people have made or anything like that. That's all down to them. Um, but, you know, you're supposed to respond to letters quickly. You're supposed, if somebody asks you a reasonable question, like, please, can you clarify this point? Or please, can you provide further and better particulars? Courts actually like it if you do, because these days litigation is all very front loaded, as we say. The idea being that it's cards on the table from a very early stage in proceedings. So people can look at that and go, OK, 
we can guess what's going to happen here. Uh, you know, it's not like a, on TV, you know, I'm going to call my surprise witnesses, each more surprising than the last. Oh, honestly, this view up here is absolutely stunning. I used to come up here a lot as a kid. Uh, I don't know if you can see that behind me. Um, you can actually see both coasts uh, from this point. Uh, but anyway, stop rambling, Al, in, <laughs> metaphorically, if not physically. Um, so, yeah, you're supposed to, like, cooperate. Um, and, you know, and it's all about, you know, you should try and do alternative dispute resolution, you know, mediation. The courts go backwards and forwards about whether they can penalise you for refusing to mediate. Uh, because the arguments are, well, look, you know, your Article 6 rights, you've got your right to a fair trial, so you don't have to mediate. You can just say, uh, no, I'll let the court sort this out. However, now they're getting more towards compulsory mediation. I mean, if you issue a small claim now under £10,000, you actually have to mediate, attempt to mediate it. Um, they do like a free mediation service. They give you a phone number and you get one hour with a mediator. The thing to remember about mediators, though, is they don't look at the merits of the case. They don't look at the legal stuff. They don't look at the factual stuff. They're basically salespeople. They're trying to sell a solution that everybody can live with. I mean, we always say a good mediation is one where both sides walk away equally peed off. Um, but the other good thing about mediation is it's all without prejudice. So you can, in open correspondence, say things like, we think this is perfect for mediation and you should stop dragging this out and insisting we go to court. We can sort all this out if, you know, with a bit of goodwill on both sides. But then of course you actually turn up to the mediation and just sit there and go, nah, <laughs> you know, we want your kidney and your firstborn child in settlement. Um, because of course, you know, the without prejudice stuff doesn't get before the court. Now, actually, when we send stuff off, we always say without prejudice, save us to costs. Now, by putting save us to costs, that means after the trial, whether you win or lose, you can say, okay, all this stuff that was, you know, confidential, now the trial's over, we can show you, and we can actually show that they were being twerps and they were being uncooperative. Um, and they, you know, they, they weren't trying to, try to mediate. I'm just gonna go over, because there's a, what we call a Logan stone here. It's one of those stones where you stand on it and it rocks. Now, interestingly, I have to dig this out. There was a Logan stone in the 19th century and some army officer and his guys, they all got drunk and they tipped it off down the bottom, so it rolled to the bottom of the mountain. And when his superiors found out about that, not only did they put him on a charge and court-martial him, they made them put it back. <laughs> so it's like, it's like it's like being at the bottom of the mountain now. It's like, well, tough, it's not our problem. You knocked it down, you get it up there. So they had to like, you know, get loads of oxen and cattle and horses and stuff and like hire loads of labourers to drag it all the way back up to the top of the mountain and put it back. Although apparently it doesn't rock now. Uh, so this is a Logan stone. I'm gonna, this is probably the stupidest thing to do while holding a selfie stick. But, whoa, right, I don't know if you can see this, I'll tip down. Uh, I know this has been here since like the Ice Age, but because it sort of overhangs the edge uh, quite a lot, hang on, I'll just spin that round so you can see. Oh, so, I mean, it's not a very long way down, it's only about 20 feet, but when you've got like probably 60 tonnes of boulder that would land on the back of you, it probably feels quite a lot heavier. Uh, there you go, I don't know if you can see the coast. Uh, anyway, what am I myself rambling about? Uh, come back. Come on, come back. Selfie. Come back into selfie mode. There we go. Um, now I've got to get down again. Now, in the old days, I would have just jumped on this and landed all cat-like and delicate. But I'm just wearing my fake Converse today, so I'm not really particularly good for climbing. Um, so, yeah, when it comes to, like, you know, your conduct during the litigation, uh, when it comes to cost, that is a big thing. So I always advise people be as cooperative as you can. I mean, you can actually do pre-issue disclosure. You can say, look, we want to sue you, or we're thinking about it, but it might be you've got a fantastic defence that we don't know about. So how about, before we issue this, you disclose all the documents you would have to do anyway. Or you can ask for site visits and say, we'd like to, you know, say it's a building dispute, we'd like to send our expert round to check out the state of the building work, and then they'll just, you know, they can tell us whether you were negligent or not. Because um, the idea there is, um, you know, if you don't have a claim, you may as well find out as soon as possible. Um, so you can go to court. If, if people don't agree to that, you can just go to court and say, um, please order pre-issue disclosure or pre-order uh, an inspection. Now, the courts don't like what we call fishing expeditions, which is, well, please disclose stuff. We've got no idea if we do have a claim, but we reckon if we route around your documents, we might find something. Ooh, it's very midges. Um, 
so fishing expeditions are very much frowned upon. <laughs> oh God, I'm swallowing a lot of midges and as a vegan, that's wrong on so many levels. I think I'll just leave them to it. Um, oh, I, I do love trig points. I love a trig point. They're one of my favorite things. Um, so yeah, so, you know, courts will quite often grant that and stuff. So again, and the trouble with an application is, People have applied for something. If you say, no, no, I don't want you to inspect this, the court says, well, you should let them. The risk there is that uh, you end up paying the cost of that application. Although quite often they'll do a thing where they'll say costs in the case. In other words, we won't deal with costs now. We'll see who ultimately uh, wins or loses and we'll deal with the costs um, then. Um, so, so there you go. So like I say, it's a very weird thing. And some people have said, it is a bit contradictory that before issuing you're under no obligation whatsoever to cooperate, but as soon as that claim form is issued, then the courts expect you to all be uh, uber friendly and try and resolve things. So uh, there you go. Um, right, um, I'm gonna head over to some more rocks in a second. Hang on, I'll spin that round and just show you. I'm gonna have a clamber on those. There are actually three Logan stones up here. Uh, and stuff because um, you know I do, I do like a wobbly stone um, so I'll go inspect those in a minute but anyway come back out oh I'm going to remember before actually I get to the end of the video for once because somebody suggested and said why don't you just write it on your hat if you did find this vaguely useful vaguely interesting vaguely informative vaguely accurate please consider liking sharing subscribing and all that sort of youtube stuff i mean like i say now i've got me 25,000 subscribers thank you to all everybody and please keep checking because youtube randomly unsubscribes people um but i'm really really happy with that because like i say i just enjoy doing these videos for you um because i get to come to beautiful spots like this and also some of the um Cornish people have pointed out about my massacring of Cornish place names, uh, to which all I can say is, look mate, get back to me when you've decided whether it's Prasans or Prasans.